to another amazing episode of IVF BFF here at Gen 5 Fertility. I am so excited. I'm Rika. I'm your host this evening, and I am here with Melissa and Marissa. Hi. We're so lucky to have them here every week. They are not only your IVF coordinators during the cycle, but they come here once a month at nighttime to talk a little bit more about some of the questions that we have. Last time we had so many questions overflowing our screen, so we didn't get a chance to get to all of them. So we'll start this time with going through some of the questions that we missed last time. And then as this goes on, please feel free to ask any questions that you have during this. And of course, we have the two professionals here to be able to kind of walk us through everything. So I'd love to start off by just saying, you know, how has your journey been so far working at Gen 5? And and what are some of the things that you'd like to say to your patients right off the bat? I love it. I love working at Gen 5. I love, I love Dr. Wood. I love my team. Um, I love my patients. I think, you know, it's really fun working here and it's really rewarding. Mm -hmm. It's so funny because I just told Dr. Wood today. <laughs> I said, I just love what I do, mm -hmm. and I love coming to work every day, and, and there are some stressful days, but of course, I think it really is something, because I'm so passionate about it, it's um, it's something that I just love doing. Yeah. I love um, the relationship that I have with my patients, and I know that every one of them, their journey is different, mm -hmm. so um, it's hard, because I feel for them, yeah. and so um, today, you know, we get to give the highs of highs today, but gave some pregnancy test results that were awesome, and then there's some not so good tests, mm. so, but it's just very rewarding, yeah. and I love it. That's why I really love what the team here at Gen 5 Fertility has been able to create, and Dr. Wood, creating a place where from the start of your fertility journey until the end, there mm -hmm. is every route, every option, every path that you could possibly need to take in a journey like this available mm -hmm. all under one roof so mm -hmm. that's again another reason why we just love being here and love the team and all mm -hmm. of the amazing things that you do on a daily basis yeah so let's jump into some questions let's do it um i think the first question that we missed last time that's such a big question melissa if you could help with this one what is the difference between mini ivf and just a regular IVF cycle. Can you tell us a little bit about the difference there? A couple things. So um, here at Gen 5, Dr. Wood um, really follows a different type of protocol for even standard IVF, right? He's a big believer on low dosing of medication mm -hmm. anyways. Right. So he's never going to do high dosing medication. Um, so really the difference between IVF and mini IVF is the type of medication regimen you're on. The retrieval is the same, the IVF lab is the same, your embryologist is the same, the same process. So it really is just the medication protocol. And you may not have as many visits mm -hmm. needed. And sometimes it will coincide with a more natural cycle versus a pretreatment cycle. See, okay. Mm -hmm. And in what circumstances do you typically recommend many IVF over just regular IVF cycle? Patients who have a more lower ovarian reserve or a fewer follicle count mm -hmm. um, would be someone who qualified for a mini IVF or a mm -hmm. lower AMH. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Perfect. Or maybe someone who hasn't done well with, um, you know, stimulation medications that we may just do a lower dosing for them and a lower protocol for them. So we can kind of look at the whole thing. Yeah. So those mm -hmm. are some of the factors. Okay. Beautiful. Well, thanks for talking about that a little bit. Now, Marissa, yeah. if someone has had a recent failed IVF cycle mm -hmm. and, you know, they're they're thinking about doing this again, mm -hmm. is it something that is recommended to go right away or does Dr. Wood and your team typically like to wait a little bit? It just depends on the person. I mean, we, we go into a cycle, you know, one after another. Um, we definitely make sure that the patient's ready um, follicle-wise, right. um, hormone-wise, before we even start stimulation. Um, so it, it has no effect if you were to do, or there's no negative effect if you were to do it, you know, subsequently versus waiting a while. It's, it's basically, you know, the, the same. Usually um, patients 
um, tend to do better the second cycle because we understand their body and we understand how they respond to medication. Um, so yeah, we, we do either or. One after another, we have patients coming from out of the country who need to get multiple cycles done in a short period of time, so we do that. Um, but like I said, we, we base everything off of hormones and if their body's ready, if they're not, then we're not going to push the body to do something it's not ready for. Right, and you are creating these personalized protocols for each patient. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of times the second time around, like you said, now you understand, you know, maybe this portion didn't work or this amount, you have to adjust it and you're mm -hmm. ready for that second time to work amazing. And so mm -hmm. you have kind of that first, at least place to go off of for yeah. the next cycle. So yeah, I, I love that you said that, you know, we can go right away if they're ready for it. And this time around, we're prepared. We now know what not to do and things to change mm -hmm. that's going to work specifically for that patient. Mm -hmm. That's perfect. Now, outside of the IVF field, which, you know, is really what we do here, Melissa, what are some things that patients can do outside of here, like, you know, lifestyle or whether it be massages, acupuncture, those types of things, do they help and what do you recommend? I think overall they help a lot with the stress level. Right, yeah. And in, in our previous webinars we've talked about nutrition, we've talked about um, um, acupuncture as well, um, mental health. Mm -hmm. um, and so acupuncture is great for patients. Um, and so is, you know, living a, a healthier lifestyle and what they eat. Um, and exercise. And so we've kind of touched on all of those um, points during our previous webinar. And I think healthy um, eating is important, well balanced, you know, well balanced diet, excuse me, right. and, and doing things that kind of help relieve the stress during an IVF cycle. And mm -hmm. so you, you, you know, acupuncture and massage therapy is also really good. Absolutely, because mm -hmm. a lot of the things such as AMH can be affected by your stress level and, you know, what your day-to-day -day kind of looks like. So doing those things may not have this huge impact, but just kind of relaxing you and getting you ready for this journey that's very different from the traditional mm -hmm. route. Mm -hmm. And it's, a, it's an outlet for a patient, yes. Mm -hmm. well, we need those outlets when we're doing something like this. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Great point. Now, when it comes to um, Marissa, Mm -hmm. They maybe just had that failed cycle, mm -hmm. and they're going to go do this again within the next month. Mm -hmm. Is this something that, you know, you can use the previous medication from your cycle if you didn't finish, or if there's some left, can you use it towards a new cycle? How does that typically work with medication? Um, typically, what our pharmacists recommend, and also Dr. Wood, if it's been opened or punctured, we don't want to use it if, if it's been about 28 days. Um if it's within that 28 day window that they've opened it, it's okay to use. We typically like patients to, um, you know, start a new pack because we don't know if it's been compromised. Um, so we just, we do, we start all new medications, but anything that's not been opened, we, we can use. Perfect. It's re recommended. It's recommended. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think that's good to know. It's mm -hmm. a good thing to know kind of, and for, you know, prepare yourself mm -hmm. early on. Now, is there a pre-IVF checklist? I know this is a big question, but... Yeah, there, there... there is a pre-IVF checklist. It's, it's pretty lengthy, but we need to make sure, you know, patients are ready to go um, through an IVF cycle and they've passed all of these tests. So the checklist can, can go from, you know, a set of labs where we do infectious disease testing that's required um, to have by the lab here. And anywhere you go, um, you have to have infectious disease um, for both patient and partner. We do vitamin D, we do testosterone, we do thyroid, um, we do prolactin. Um, we also test your um, fallopian tubes. We do HSG. We don't do it here personally, but we recommend you get that done before we do an embryo transfer. Um, semen analysis within six months. It's a pretty lengthy list, but we have... Did you guys in the audience make sure to take all of that down? <laughs> <laughs> but when you're a patient here at Gen 5, you are assigned to a pretreatment coordinator Perfect. and an IVF coordinator. And that pretreatment coordinator helps you go through all of those tests, and they review all of your records with the IVF coordinator, and they help 
they help guide the patient on where to go for those tests or, you know, whatever is needed. And we do too. We help yeah. as well. Absolutely. And I know that you mainly focus on the treatment side of things, but mm -hmm. uh, somebody just asked right now, based off of the list that you gave, mm -hmm. is there um, a bit of insurance that could potentially cover mm -hmm. some of these costs, maybe even just early on some of the testing that you were mentioning? I think it's important to try to get some of these tests done through your primary care doctor mm -hmm. to try to get the insurance to cover some of them. Mm -hmm. It is diagnostic and you know we don't have control over what gets covered by the insurance, but if your primary care doctor or your gynecologist can order these tests for you and get them done, we would love that. You know, one less thing for the patient to have to worry about. Absolutely. But they're just, these checklists are just really beneficial for the patient to make sure they're cleared and they, you know, they're, these things have been checked off because ultimate goal is to achieve a pregnancy. Absolutely. You want to make sure that you're okay before you start to carry pregnancy. Yeah, of course, yeah. of course. And it's just about kind of setting yourself up to have the best outcome possible. So, mm -hmm. and it's important to do the work early on. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. So when it comes to the injections, Marissa, mm -hmm. you know, you're both of you kind of you come here and you help with injections when needed. And that's such a big part of all of this emotionally, physically, and really medically. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to the injections, you know, are there any tips and tricks that you kind of send people home with? Of course, you give them a full description of what to do, but are there some ways to kind of make it a little bit easier or get through it a little bit? Smoother? Yeah, when we do our um, injection training, if patients need it um, who haven't done it before, you know, we, we tell them exactly what to do. Um, if you're doing subcutaneous injections in the abdomen, um, we recommend ice seeing beforehand. That kind of helps numb the area. Um, when our embryo transfer patients do IM injections in the backside, um, we recommend icing beforehand and then using a heat pack afterwards to help massage that medication um, into the muscle. Um, but, yeah, I mean, we, we go over all that with our patients. But do you have any other tips? Um, I think overall we kind of go over all the medications, we send them links, mm -hmm. you know, because yeah. it's scary to learn something like that for the first time, especially if they've never had to do an injection before. Mm -hmm. So you, they get a bunch of information and then they go home and they're like, oh, what did she say? <laughs> oh, what am I supposed to do with that? And so mm -hmm. we give them links to videos to, to kind of something to kind of refresh their memory. Yeah. Um, and then but we do, you know, if they have a hard time, we're here to teach them and do that first injection with them sometimes. Absolutely. It can be scary. And, and like Marissa pointed out, when they have to do their IM injection in the backside, you know, we'll come in and do those injections with them until they feel comfortable because that's a much larger needle <laughs> and it's scary to have to like do that injection. So we'll have partners or friends or family members come in that are going to give that injection yeah. and train them too. Because you know, ultimately, it's we want that injection to go well because Absolutely. we want the outcome to be positive. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's a really good point. Well, now jumping back a little bit to before the pretreatment or mm -hmm. before the stimulation, mm -hmm. what is the point of pretreatment? And I get I get this question a lot. Mm -hmm. So it's because it's just typically birth control pills or something along those lines. But what is the point of it? It's some form of a birth control, an estrogen, yeah, something. Really just think of it as everyone's about to start a marathon. Your ovaries are about to start this marathon. And everyone's lining up at the, the starting line. And that's kind of what pretreatment does. It keeps the ovaries kind of quiet so that the follicles are all together, hopefully around the same size. Mm -hmm. And they're about to, hit, you know, the gun's about to go off and the race is about to start. Mm -hmm. So they need to, we're trying to line them all up to start the race together to grow Absolutely. together and so that's what kind of pretreatment does it kind of keeps everything kind of quiet so that when we turn around and start stimulation medication they're starting the race together mm -hmm. and we hopefully totally don't amazing. have too much you know asymmetry. Asymmetry. yeah because yeah. mm -hmm. that pretreatment helps with getting follicles symmetrical mm -hmm. i mean you're always going to have some asymmetry mm -hmm. um, when stimulating not everything's going to grow the same but majority of the time it does mm -hmm. and pretreatment that's the point of pretreatment is everything to grow symmetrically mm -hmm. when you don't do pretreatment or don't do it correctly mm -hmm. there is a lot of asymmetry and then when you're in your stimulation cycle you'll have like 
large follicles here, small follicles here, and um, you you can tend to have more immature eggs. Right, that's what we and, follow up with. And we eggs. want mature eggs. Yeah. Um, and we, I mean, there's there's ways we can, you know, go about doing, if you have a lot of asymmetry, we do something called a duo stem, where we go after the larger follicles, and then we continue stimulation after that and go after the smaller. Retrieval. Yep, exactly. Got it. Okay, very But cool. we try to avoid that. Right. And do um, just... We'll off the bat, all symmetrical, and go after all of those follicles here. So then that's the importance of that pretreatment, mm -hmm. making sure, again, like we've been kind of talking about throughout this webinar, is setting yourself up so that when the race starts, they're all kind of ready to go at the same time. Yeah, yeah. Completely understand that. Mm -hmm. Now, there was a question that was just asked about why should I do a three IVF cycle or two versus doing just the one? Mm -hmm. And I think um, it, the portion that maybe I can talk to a little bit is financially, you know, you're kind of setting yourself up so that you have that option mm -hmm. that in case the first round of IVF didn't necessarily go the way that you had anticipated, mm -hmm. even if maybe you had the follicles and they just didn't grow in the way that they should have, or they didn't mature and reach blast, mm -hmm. you know, you have that safety net where you're not paying full price to start over with a new cycle. Yeah. So financially, that's the benefit of doing these types of packages because you can just store as many embryos as you can and then mm -hmm. come back later and then do a transfer when you feel like you have a solid amount saved over for yourself and for mm -hmm. siblings. But exactly. medically, what's the importance of, of kind of going and setting yourself up with, with a three-cycle mm -hmm. package? Well, women who don't make a lot of follicles, it's – it's really important that they do multiple cycles because we don't we don't know how many of those are going to reach blast and we don't know how many are going to be normal. Mm -hmm. So it's it kind of gives them a safety net that if they want more than one child, they they have that opportunity to bank as many embryos as possible, mm -hmm. hopefully normal embryos, and they have an option. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, God forbid we don't have a you know, a successful transfer, at least we have more embryos to work with. Absolutely. I mean, our, our transfer success is really high, but there's always a, there's always a chance of miscarriage. Mm -hmm. There's always a chance of not implanting. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, multi-cycle plan or doing multi, multiple cycles, it, it just gives that safety net and security so you don't have to go through it again. Absolutely. And That's don't, the beauty of it. Exactly. And, I mean, when you're – you're going through IVF at 40 years old and let's say you only did one cycle and you only got one or two normal embryos, but later on you wanted a third child, then how your eggs may be different at 45, 46. I mean, they will be at their point. They're going to be different, but the, if you had banked more eggs, you have more of a opportunity. You have your 40 year old eggs. Yeah even at 45. Mm -hmm. And I think that's another really amazing point that you brought up is, is the good side of this is when you do get pregnant mm -hmm. and then you have just done the one cycle, but now you're holding this bundle of joy and you're looking over at your partner and you're like, I need maybe two or three more, you know, mm -hmm. but you come back and you have to start that process from square one yeah. versus had you set yourself up you'd be coming back to just do a transfer with yeah. the same embryos that you mm -hmm. had in your first pregnancy. Yeah. So I think that's such a great point that you're bringing that up because do the hard work now. Set yourself up mm -hmm. for the beautiful outcome that you will inevitably want because mm -hmm. you know, a lot of families that have the one will come back for another. Yeah. So exactly. Perfect. Thank you for that. It's really great. Did you have anything to add on that? Oh no, that was, that was good. good. Yeah. <laughs> I think Let's she did great. Over. Yeah. <laughs> um, when should people freeze their eggs? This is so huge. I love this topic. I yeah. think more I love women... this topic too. <laughs> this is my favorite. This yeah. is so powerful. More women should know yes. about this. More women should read about it, do yeah. it, get in here, where, or, you know, whatever, I, wherever you are. I think women should freeze their eggs as soon That's as they can. Right. Financially, no, it's a lot. Absolutely. But, I mean, I mean, early 20s, like early 20s, those are when your eggs are young and, and beautiful. And you don't, at that time, most women don't know when they're going to get married, what they want to do with their lives. 
And that's, if they don't okay. want to get married. <laughs> exactly. Or if they even have, want to have children, but at least you have that security. Mm-hmm. And um, I have a lot of patients who are in their mid mid 30s, late 40s, and they're like, I wish I knew about egg mm-hmm. freezing mm-hmm. when I had the chance because they could have baked more eggs. And mm-hmm. you know, at the, right now they're only banking, you know, five to ten eggs, and that's not bad, but they have to kind of do it multiple times and we want you want to have options Absolutely. and you want that you know sense of freedom and security mm-hmm. because life can change and life happens life happens every day yeah so. but it's it's almost like car insurance right mm-hmm. you don't get car insurance because you expect that you're going to get into an accident but mm-hmm. in case it happens then you have this blanket of security that you know mm-hmm. is going to kind of take care of it and in this mm-hmm. case I always think, my gosh, you know, some of the women that are in their 40s and 50s, had they really known about this sooner in life mm-hmm. and could have just come here when they found Mr. Right at 50 yeah. and said, okay, this is my man, I'm ready, or my woman, or whatever their yeah. circumstances. Yeah. And now I want to have a baby. I want that to be my biological child mm-hmm. and, and do it this way. Also, too, it's not, I mean, we kind of talk about career wise, too. They, we're not 100% sure, but like I've had women who froze their eggs earlier in life and are coming to us now, you know, who went through chemotherapy and they haven't had any, or, you know, they don't have any follicles left. And it's so, I mean, they're so grateful that they did that before. I mean, wow. you don't know what happens. Like anything can happen in life. At least you have that chance, mm-hmm. you know? Absolutely. So I think it's, I think it's good for any family planning, any future planning, I highly, highly recommend it. I think, you know, if you're unsure about doing it, do it. It's something you will never regret. And if you never use them, you can donate them to a family who who does want them. Oh, that's a beautiful gesture, too. Mm -hmm. These beautiful eggs can, you know, be used either way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I see we have a lot of questions coming in. But while we're on this topic, I just wanted to throw in one more point here is what how important is the lab staff in something like freezing your eggs for a longer period of time it's huge I think we're really fortunate to have the two embryologists that we have and um, both of them um, have years of experience I mean mm-hmm. Dr. Adam's 30 and I think Molly it's more than 20 years wow. but um, Molly actually that's what she did. I mean, she ran an egg bank, and so yeah. she was able to freeze eggs. And so there's a special technique that's used, and it's really important to use a lab that has that experience mm-hmm. because you want to make sure that your eggs have been frozen properly and thawed properly when it's time to use right. them. Right, yeah. absolutely. Because mm-hmm. we've had cases where we've got brought in eggs from elsewhere mm-hmm. yeah. when they de-thawed. You know, none of them or a very little amount is even viable. Mm -hmm. But here, anytime it's done, Mm -hmm. then they de-thaw and Mm -hmm. they do an insemination. The results are almost as good as our fresh results, Mm -hmm. which is unheard of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that just goes to show how important the lab is Mm -hmm. in all of this. I think, too, is that they really care about what they're freezing. Right. The the integrity of that, um, you know, making sure they're mature making sure they, you know, they are, they look like good quality eggs to freeze. And they're not just freezing everything. They're Mm -hmm. freezing good quality, mature eggs. Great. One of the questions that we had is about PRP, ovarian rejuvenation and success rates and processes. It's, Mm -hmm. it's a big question. And I think Uh, Just to let you all know as well, we have dedicated webinars that Dr. Wood has hosted. You'll see me on there too, but Dr. Wood has hosted those webinars and they're actually recorded and they're on our website and on YouTube as well. So at any point, if you'd like to have a full webinar that's going to go through all of that, and I think from the source himself, Dr. Wood, who's kind of pioneered all this, would be the best one to answer those questions for you. So definitely once this is done, if you still have questions about PRP, please visit those webinars. We spent a lot of time setting them up, so I know that you'll enjoy them and there's great questions answered in there. Mm-hmm. Perfect. So um, I guess this next question is is actually a good one too because you know it pertains to some of the families that we work with. 
at what point, you know, how many eggs or how many follicles would there need to be in order to cancel a cycle? Like, is there a minimum that you are going to force somebody to have 10 follicles or else we're not going to move forward? That's what I love about Gen 5. I love that we don't cancel cycles Beautiful. because, um, naturally we ovulate one follicle a month. Right. So, and people get pregnant every day with one follicle being ovulated or one, you know, one egg being ovulated. Amazing. So we, we want women to have a chance at, you know, having an egg retrieval. Um, and it only takes one, it only takes one egg. And so when we have a patient that goes through a cycle and if they're only producing one or two follicles, we're still going to move forward if they would like. Absolutely. Yeah, you would not cancel them. Yeah. We've had too many patients that come here that have been canceled when they had four or six follicles. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That could be four, it, it could four be. babies yeah. potentially, but mm -hmm. I mean, with the right center, with the right specialist, mm -hmm. one is all it takes. It's all, it's all it takes. That's yeah. beautiful. And like most of our cases though are women mm -hmm. who are in that situation and mm -hmm. We go to retrieval all the time with just one follicle, and mm -hmm. we have seen a lot of success. Right. So, I mean, it's, yeah. I think it's crazy when clinics cancel because of that. Yeah. I, and I have I, seen it countless times. I can't tell you how many consults we do, and women are getting canceled one after another. And I just think, wow, like, those are, that's so many chances. Unbelievable. Right. I, I hadn't even really heard the term canceling a cycle for any of our patients because. We give everybody a chance. Yeah. Everybody deserves a chance, you know, mm -hmm. even if it's just the one. Yeah. I know sometimes with donors, if it's not a certain amount, they'll they'll kind of reassess and get to the right amount. Yeah. But mm -hmm. and even with intended parents, it's, yeah. it's it's really rare that we do cancel. Mm -hmm. I mean, very rare. We have canceled before, but it's not because of one follicle. It's either due to you know lack of progression mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. you know something else but it's very rare that he like gives up if that follicle or those follicles are not growing at the right speed mm -hmm. during stimulation mm -hmm. is when that's when you would cancel yeah, if yeah. right that were to happen mm -hmm. I yeah. see. perfect and so you know going back kind of before we reach this level is maybe this one is talking a little bit about ovarian rejuvenation. So we'll do one of the questions. Absolutely. AMH is such a big factor, but it's not as important as I think some people think because you can still move forward even if you have a lower or even sometimes undetectable AMH mm -hmm. as long as you have a follicle. Mm -hmm. What what role does AMH play within ovarian rejuvenation? And do you see any differences after doing one of the different ORs, whether it's PRP, NPLAF, or ULTRA? So you can see a rise in AMH, mm -hmm. sometimes within four weeks, sometimes within eight weeks. And sometimes you may not see a rise. Sometimes you may see a little bit of a dip. Um, but what's more telling is what's on ultrasound. Right. And, and what you're seeing. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have a rise in your AMH after doing ovarian rejuvenation. Right. And I mean, we have countless patients who have undetectable AMH levels do ovarian rejuvenation and still produce follicles and eggs and embryos. Absolutely. So. And the quality, yes. that's what's important. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. not the things that you're seeing on a screen even mm -hmm. sometimes, but yeah. the quality of the embryo or the egg that's retrieved mm -hmm. after. Yeah, I was ovarian. just gonna say that. Yeah. Also what's telling is the egg retrieval, yeah. right. egg quality. Right. Um, yeah, I've had women who do ovarian rejuvenation and, you know, we only see one follicle on the screen while they're stimulating, mm -hmm. um, but their outcome is great. I mean, I've had women, most recently, she had a 5AA embryo, and it was beautiful. Um, and now we're just waiting for PGS results, but, I mean, that's what that's what we really look forward to once we see, Absolutely. you know, or after a brain rejuvenation. Yeah. And my, um, just my little... My patient was just turned 44, had ovarian rejuvenation, and only had one follicle. Wow. One embryo. And she's over 20 weeks pregnant right now. Oh, my yeah. goodness. Yeah. Can I just say, as you said that, I feel like I'm getting chills right now because mm -hmm. the question popped up, mm -hmm. and I'm just going to read it verbatim. Okay. She said, realistically, I just turned 43 last month. Mm -hmm. 
And you just said you're 44 year old patient. So this is <laughs> quite serendipitous, but she just turned 43 last month. Mm -hmm. I mean, has IVF been successful? I hate to even ask this because you just yeah. answered, but what are her chances? She doesn't want to go to a doctor and be told to go the donor egg route. She's not ready for that. Yeah. So yeah. that's one thing that doctor would, would not do. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. seriously, even our patients who have one follicle, he never even discusses donor egg right off the bat. He says, let's try, let's see what happens. Mm -hmm. And from there, we'll, you know, we'll plan next steps. But right. I mean, I would say most of our patient population mm -hmm. are women who are over 40. Absolutely. And they're, we're kind of their last hope. Right. And they only have one or two follicles. Mm -hmm. So, well, well, yeah, Melissa and I both have a lot of patients that are pregnant. That yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's beautiful. It's, I, I mean, I feel like I just, like, have them like in the palm of my hand of just the patients that are in that group between 42 and 44 years of age yeah and who only make one or two follicles mm -hmm. and some of them haven't had their transfer but have normal embryos mm -hmm. and they've only had one egg Beautiful. each and, time mm -hmm. wow yeah. Yeah. and i think that's that's what it's all about here is yeah. to not say no and not stop fighting until you know we kind of have really done as much as we can do and yeah. for that specific case where you just turned 43 congratulations it's a beautiful age it's <laughs> i think at that point in life where you're ready you've gone through some of the experience in life and now you're ready to share that with a little one so i think it's a perfect age to start and i do think too to check into ovarian rejuvenation to see if that's something that you can add along to your upcoming ivf cycle if you do because while it may not skyrocket your AMH or, you know, show a huge difference maybe on a screen, but the quality of the embryos that you're going to make is going to be a lot better, hopefully. Mm -hmm. Yes. So we can so hope. That's, that's, that's the hope. hope. That's mm -hmm. the hope. So that was a great connection there. So I love that you asked that question and I hope that that answered your, that question. We answered your question. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so getting back to the questions, uh, I, this next one, um, is is an interesting one <laughs> i guess i haven't really thought of this okay. one but um what kind of food increase egg quality and is that something that we know of yet and if we do then why is this not broadcasted yeah. in a bigger way i don't know but we did have a nutritionist on here tara coleman yeah who's wonderful um i mean she just recommends healthy clean Absolutely. eating i mean we there's i wish there was a magical food we could eat and a pill yeah. we could take to increase our egg count i know quality. you have a trick with the transfer day um that's but <laughs> that's, for, that's for baby to stick but we want, and by the way the secret is mcdonald's french fries <laughs> Yes. Don't let it get out. <laughs> yes. But um, the, the worst food you could possibly eat is, what, is what's going to make baby stick. what we recommend here at Gen 5. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I think also one of the things Tara Coleman was saying is outside of just the healthy lifestyle, plan for a pregnancy. What would you do in a pregnancy? You would stop mm -hmm. the drinking. You would maybe stop the coffee and the caffeinated drinks and yeah. the things that you do when you're pregnant. Yeah. Maybe just start to do those things earlier on, oh, and yeah. that becomes a habit yeah. and a yeah. lifestyle. But don't tell people to stop a coffee. A ah. <laughs> Easier kidding. said than done. I know. If I it's, know. It's not a fan favorite, but six, eight ounces a day is okay. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, outside of, you know, oh, I they just said that the viewer said, I appreciate my concern being answered made me feel really happy Sweet. so that's awesome that you guys did yeah. that so um this next question is actually one of my favorite things that i bother you guys a lot about <laughs> is genetic screening genetic carrier screening yeah yeah do you do it do you because is it recommended is mm -hmm. it required is it for both partners should one partner do it and then you know what what is it's, the process it's required for um, female okay. moms to do it. Mm -hmm. um, it's highly recommended 
or partner to do it at the mm -hmm. same time. Okay. Because if anything came back positive um, from mom, then we want to know, you know, right away if any if they match um, dad. Like the same way. Yeah. So um, that's we do that here. We have a couple different companies we use, and mm -hmm. they have you know discounts for both mom and dad to do it or patient and partner to do it. But yeah, it's high, it's required for female, but highly recommended that they both do it. Mm -hmm. Now let's say and it's great. Actually, it's really informational. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I want to do it. I actually keep <laughs> pushing it off. Yeah, I keep pushing off it. I need to we do had it. this conversation last week. I yeah. wanted to do this as well, but yep. one of the things too is let's say you know, both mom and dad are a carrier for the same type of, you know, genetic disorder or mutation. What are the options in that sense? I mean, had they just done this naturally, you know, they would have probably still moved forward. So I'm guessing they'd like to still move forward. What would be the options there? So we do PGTM in that case. Got it. Yeah. So if there's something that is significant, mm -hmm. then they're both carriers of the same gene mutation. Um, they'll have a genetic counseling appointment through the um, genetic um, lab that they did the test through. Mm -hmm. um, it's complimentary. And then um, if they can move forward with their IVF, um, they'll be able to do I, um, IVF and then the PGTS or PGTA and PGTM would be done. And the PGTM is to see if that embryo is a carrier or affected by that specific um, gene mutation. Beautiful. So yeah. you'll know right off the bat. Right. So cystic fibrosis is very common. Absolutely. That is one that patients have to do PGTM for. Mm -hmm. So they'll go ahead, go through IVF, whatever embryos are created and make it to blast, get biopsied. Those cells then get sent for them to be analyzed. They generally do the PGTM part first to make sure if that embryo is affected by cystic fibrosis mm -hmm. um if it's affected then they won't do the chromosome testing on it i see um if it's not affected um they'll go ahead and then do the chromosome testing to make sure it's chromosomally normal and not affected by cystic fibrosis Beautiful. so yeah so yeah. It, it's amazing technology and how far we've come to be able to do that so that we're not passing that on Absolutely. To the next generation. Beautiful. Mm. Absolutely. And you also get to learn about gender too in these types of tests. Yes. Which is, you know, of course, you're just wanting that healthy baby, but mm. definitely a fun kind of additional yeah. piece mm -hmm. of knowledge you have family early planning. on for family planning. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So the next question, and I've heard Dr. Wood talk about this one a lot, is should you try? IVF right after doing ovarian rejuvenation over just going the natural route. And I would say he always, of course, does suggest to do the IVF is kind of what I've heard him say. Mm -hmm. And maybe if you can kind of go into some of the reasons why. Um, it just depends on the patient. I mean, Melissa had a patient do ovarian rejuvenation and she got pregnant naturally. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. was, was that too not long, not too long ago? Yeah, yeah, she, she just ago. delivered. Oh, yeah. Yeah. so I mean, most patients mm -hmm. who come need to do IVF, right? Yeah. But it's it's up to Dr. Wood's plan. I mean, mm -hmm. like I said, he tailors everything to the patient, so we right. don't have like a one if, fits all. Yeah, one size fits all thing. Um, like no age group or AM age group, it's just all tailored to them and their hormone levels. Right. So um, a lot of patients will do IVF a few weeks after ovarian rejuvenation. Mm -hmm. But he is, he definitely, I know, is open if patient wants to try first naturally before they start IVF because going through IVF is a lot and some patients aren't ready for it emotionally or financially. So he definitely, you know, is... He wants the patient, to, or he supports the patient's decision. Absolutely, what they want to do so. Whichever journey is right for them, mm -hmm. path yeah. that they need to go down. Yeah, absolutely. It's, and it's also trying to maximize the benefits of right. ovarian rejuvenation. So mm -hmm. there's a window where you want to try, um, and to maximize that. Yeah. And and sometimes time is of the essence for some of these patients. So yeah. it's um, kind of being a little bit more aggressive in your treatment plan. And, and moving forward with IVF if you can. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Now, this next question is a really good question. 
And the reason that I'm saying this is because in fertility, a lot of the times we focus on what's wrong or what do we need to fix on the female mm-hmm. side of fertility. Mm-hmm. This one actually focuses more on the sperm. Mm-hmm. So the question is, a year ago, my husband had a semen analysis and his morphology was at a 1%. Mm-hmm. Now, will Dr. Wood advise them to be checked by a specialist before coming to Gen 5? Or is this something that he can kind of monitor in house? So Dr. Adams, yeah, our wonderful laboratory director, Mm -hmm. she actually specializes in male factor. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of patients whose partners have male, severe male factor, severe, severe male factor. Um, And patients will come to us and, you know, Dr. Wood will give his opinion. We will refer them out to uh, male fertility specialists or urologists. Um, We commonly use Dr. Pastuba. But Dr. Adams likes to see for herself as well the sperm and kind of give her opinion. Mm -hmm. Um, Just recently, actually, we had um, patients who had, or he has severe male factor, and um, we did so many, so many semen analysis here. But we, they have never had blastocysts. And we got four was amazing oh my gosh they were super happy um and then i i have a patient who's pregnant now uh, who just graduated and husband has severe severe male factor and she's pregnant and Mm. it's just wonderful but it's (laughs) we we have them come in still and Mm. dr wood will give his opinion absolutely kind of the first check at least Mm. before then going elsewhere with when there is male factor fertility, I mean, that's the one beauty of IVF. Mm -hmm. ICSI really changed that, the world of male fertility Mm -hmm. or male factor fertility um, so that even though there may be low count, low morphology, um, poor mortality, Mm -hmm. you know, IVF kind of helps with that. You Mm -hmm. know, I mean, we're, the embryologists are, whether there's a million sperm or, you know, or 20 sperm, they're looking under the microscope and selecting the best sperm to inject into the egg. Mm-hmm. So having male factor fertility, um, IVF really helps with that. Yeah. So um, again, ICSI kind of changed that for patients who had severe male factor. Mm-hmm. And ICSI is the process of kind of washing the sperm or? No, it's no, actually okay. the, it's intracy- intracytoplasmic sperm injection. So the sperm has been prepped and washed a, a special way, but then the sperm is then selected and injected into the egg. So one sperm per egg. Mm-hmm. And so you kind of ensure fertilization has occurred. So if male factor is a problem, that kind of eliminates that in a sense because we're not doing traditional insemination where mm-hmm. we're putting a little droplet of sperm on the egg. We're actually injecting sperm into the egg. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So. Perfect. Well, we are kind of coming to the end of this webinar, and I feel like this round we've had such incredible questions. Oh, my yeah. goodness. We kind of really got to the root of a lot of mm-hmm. topics here that I'm sure you guys answer a lot of times in your kind of your inbox. But um, I guess we will end it with one final question. And the question is that they were able to create one healthy embryo. And it's waiting. I think we're babysitting so far, but <laughs> but now before they do their transfer, should they do ovarian rejuvenation? Is that something that affects a transfer and, and that type of thing? Or or just use that embryo and do your transfer? If if they're planning on doing another AVF cycle, maybe, but okay. um we do if lining is an issue. Because we're really just focused on the, the uterus right. for embryo transfer part. If lining is an issue, we do do PRP in the lining. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. We also use medication to help thicken up the lining. But I wouldn't I wouldn't recommend ovarian rejuvenation for um, right 
embryo transfer because mainly to create embryos is when you would want to do the ovarian rejuvenation and again ovarian rejuvenation is such a massive topic and there's so many different aspects to it like Mm -hmm. even just the three separate treatments and what those three are kind of for so Mm -hmm. definitely tune into the webinar i know there's so many questions that we had that kind of went towards the ovarian rejuvenation and while we would love to spend time talking about that maybe next month (laughs) (laughs) but um for now Thank you so much. (laughs) Thank you so much for joining us today. And if you have any additional questions, please tune into our Instagram account. That's where we actually will save a lot of your questions. We'll knock on Dr. Wood's door and get him to answer those and pop those up on our live stories every once in a while. So if you'd like to kind of get some of your questions answered that way, of course, what we always recommend is schedule a consultation reach out to your IVF coordinators, make sure to set yourself up early for the best possible outcome. Thank you all again so much. We also do have our Facebook page as well. So feel free to tune into that as well. And we hope that you have a great rest of your night, a wonderful weekend and a wonderful journey here at Gen 5 Fertility.